Hello and welcome everyone to the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit North America happening here in Seattle. And glad to have you all here. Uh, good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, depending on which part of the globe you're watching it from. Uh, myself as an amazing and the CTO for Watson Data and AI OSS platform uh, in a team in IBM called Code. And with me, I have my colleague, Andrew. Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Andrew. I work on the Kubeflow and uh, Trusted AI integration in Kubeflow project on, under Animesh's team, Code. Great, thanks a lot, Andrew. So uh, we'll share our slides. And as you know, today, the topic we are going to discuss essentially is around uh, the security in AI, right? Um, of late, we have been seeing a lot of the security incidents and, and obviously AI being at the forefront. Uh, that's a topic which we want to address. So. Can you see my slides? Yep. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the topic for today we are going to talk about is how to defend your models against adversarial attacks, right? And uh, what do we mean by adversarial attacks? Uh, how to do that, right? We will have it, you know, as we move forward through the slides. So as we introduced ourselves, my name is Animesh Singh, and this is my colleague, Andrew Butler. We are a part of a group in IBM called Kodi. Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. Um, what you see here is a very nice uh, picture of our lab in um, Silicon Valley in South San Jose, uh, uh, you know, nestled in, in green hills, a lot of uh, nice hiking trails. We have a cricket field as well. So if you want to be in Silicon Valley, but don't want to be bothered by the hustle and bustle of Silicon Valley and want a quieter place, this is the place to be. Uh, majority of the team is here, but obviously, you know, um, uh, being a global company, you know, we have distributed members uh, across the globe. And and typically, you know, in Corday, we contribute to a large number of projects across uh, different parts of the AI lifecycle. Now, a bit about uh, IBM in general, right? So Corday is a group in IBM, right? And IBM has a history of tech for social good, right? We were uh, have been involved in a lot of these use cases where uh, it has come to social good. Uh, Moon Landing was a project, right, where we had, you know, virtually uh, thousands of IBMers actually working in close collaboration with NASA in terms of, you know, uh, enabling it. IBM has been doing a lot around human genome sequencing and off late with efforts like Call for Code. We have been doing a lot around how to respond to infectious diseases, how to handle climate change. Uh, we are doing it in partner partnership with United Nations, uh, etc. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in a lot of these activities, please do reach out to us. Uh, uh, you know, we run hackathons, we run projects, and a lot is going on into these spaces. Now, um, carrying forward that tradition, right, we have also been working uh, very heavily towards, you know, how to bring um, trust and ethics and how to build responsible AI, right? Uh, even before this became a buzzword, you know, IBM has been very active. IBM research has been very active in this field over the course of last, I would say, uh, four to five years now, and has been working a lot to to look at techniques, technologies, algorithms, a lot of which, you know, made their way into research papers, finally landing into code, uh, which essentially, you know, are catered towards how to uh, make sure that, you know, the AI uh, which you are building, the AI platforms you are using, the models which you are producing, the data sets you are building, using they are being done in a trusted transparent and ethical way now what is our vision for trusted ai right uh, essentially currently we are looking at it from the perspective of four pillars robustness right so and that's essentially the topic of the day for today uh, like can anyone tamper uh, with your ai models right is are your data sets tamper proof right so robustness is essentially you know how do you measure uh, the security of your ai infrastructure ai platform and ai assets Fairness, uh, is your model fair? Is it giving biased outputs? Uh, is it discriminating against a particular gender, a particular race, particular religion? Uh, explainability, can the model explain its predictions? Can the model, uh, you know, when it is, for example, making life-changing decisions for you, whether you get admitted to your university or not, or whether you know, you're getting a loan or not, is it able to tell you why? Because, and last but not the least, uh, lineage, which is essentially, you know, uh, having the auditability and the governance all built into the AI lifecycle. Can you trace back if a model is making a certain prediction? 
what data set it was trained on, what version of the TensorFlow or PyTorch or what framework was used, what was the version, what were the hyperparameters used. Uh, you know, uh, when you actually created a new data set, you did feature engineering, what were the features used to produce that model? So the whole traceability and lineage, how do you handle that field? And for that, we have a project in that space as well. Now, when we map, you know, these are the four projects uh, which we have moved in open source because when we talk about trusted, you cannot have the code hidden behind the firewalls of your organization and have it in a proprietary manner. We want to move that code out in the open and you know, do it literally jointly with the community, right? So IBM open sourced a lot of these projects in the trusted AI umbrella. Uh, one of the first ones to go out, adversarial robustness 360, or in short, what we call ART, right? Which is focused around robustness, and we will have more details around this project later on as we move forward. The second one around fairness, uh, AI fairness 360, or AIF 360, as we call it in short. And this has, you know, around, uh, uh, 70 plus metrics on which you can measure fairness, uh, more than 10 algorithms on which you, which you can use to actually, you know, uh, mitigate bias in your data sets and models, right? And very, very uh, popular uh, project of our own being used in a lot of industries. So if you're interested in, in the fairness part of Trusted AI, definitely take a look at it. Is it easy to understand? Explainability. Is your model explaining why is it making certain decisions for you? Right, and that's a project which we have in that space called AI Explainability 360 or AIX 360 in short. Uh, it also provides an interface on top of very popular explainability toolkits like Lime and SHAP. Uh, definitely check it out. And last but not the least, is it accountable, right? So we have a project called AI Fact Sheet 360. Um, think of it like, you know, creating a standard around uh, like the way you are used to seeing the nutrition labels on food items. Uh, think of it, you know, similarly a label being produced for any AI asset in the marketplace, right? Can you actually have all the lineage and data into that standardized format document? So, um, you know, obviously uh, when we started these projects in IBM Research, uh, the goal was, yes, first it was the research papers which went out in the community, then the actual code we moved in open source, but open source on its own is not enough, right? What we did next was essentially moved it in open governance. So that means not a single vendor, including IBM, we are not, we didn't want to control this project. We want it to be developed collaboratively with community with a lot of participation coming in. And what better way to do it um, uh, uh, than, you know, moving it in an open governance in a neutral foundation so we joined forces with Linux Foundation AI and Data, and coincidentally, we are speaking at the Linux Foundation conference here, and we actually donated these projects there, um, and they are being part of it and, and growing there rapidly with the advent of community and, and uh, with a neutral licensing, neutral trademark in a neutral place with the right governance model. And to actually advance the conversation and the technologies and the principles around this whole space, we launched a Linux Foundation AI and Data Trusted AI Committee, right? With a focus on two groups, what we call principles working group and the technical working group. Uh, obviously, IBM had a vision and IBM had a set of, you know, the pillars for trusted AI, but we wanted to work collaboratively with the community, with the likes of Orange, Microsoft, uh, Tencent, Ethical ML Institute, AI for People, uh, General Motors, et cetera, and, and come up with a combined view of this trusted AI committee. What do they mean uh, when we call uh, and when we define something as trusted and ethical uh, in the AI world? So that's where, you know, the principles working group is focused and the technical working group is actually focused on, you know, leveraging and producing and contributing code to make sure, you know, all the use cases in this particular space are, are being addressed. Uh, I'm the North America chair for the Linux Foundation AI Trusted Committee, and we meet, you know, monthly uh, to go through all these uh, tools and technologies. And a lot of these, you know, member participating companies actually come and present what they are doing. So if you're interested, definitely join this. You know, a lot of interesting discussions and presentations and, and advancement of the trusted AI happening through this committee. Now, one of the things, as I mentioned, right, one of the things which the Linux Foundation AI and Data Trusted AI Committee came up with was what it means uh, in terms of the principles uh, when you call something trusted, uh, trusted AI, right? So the eight principles which it came back with reproducibility, uh, reproducibility robustness, equitability, privacy, explainability, accountability, transparency, and security. Um, there is 
a white paper behind this. There is, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit of presentations. We have upcoming webinars and a lot of participating companies, which you saw on the pre previous slide have actually come up together uh, to produce this. So if you need more details, definitely, you know, uh, please reach out to me and I can point you to, to these um, details, why we came up with these principles and what do they essentially mean going in the background. And today, we are actually going to be focused on security. That is going to be the focus of our talk, right? So essentially security in AI. So let's uh, move forward into this particular space of trusted and ethical AI, right? And we have been seeing over the course of last year, obviously, you know, this is um, the last uh, year and a half have been uh, very unprecedented. We are living in times of a global pandemic, but what we have also seen is over the course of last uh, year, you know, the amount of uh, ransomware attacks, the cyber crimes, the cyber attacks, they have increased a lot, essentially. And that tells, you know, the obviously the hackers are trying to take advantage of some part of the relaxed security posture, but it's also, you know, the, uh, you know, sign of the times that the companies need to embrace and brace up and make sure that, you know, what they are doing in context of security in general is, is you know, really hardened. I mean, obviously, uh, one of the things which we saw very recently, a lot of these uh, CEOs, including our own, Arvind Krishna from IBM met President Biden to actually, you know, form a task force around cybersecurity. Right now, when we talk about state of security for AI, what we feel is that, you know, in general, the awareness of risk is low. There is very low understanding of what AI security means. And the security posture is, you know, uh, almost not there, right? Uh, uh, which is actually also prompting analysts like Gartner to come back and say that, hey, uh, and they have actually talked to 600 plus executives, right? And and all of those these executives are concerned that machine learning is actually presenting a new attack surface increasing the security risks and, and they're concerned that we don't have enough to actually defend uh, ourselves against it, right? So there is there is a lot of realization in the community, in the companies that this is something which we now need to address, right? Now, obviously when you are looking at uh, uh, what we call private and secure AI, right? uh you want to be able to handle it from multiple angles right so uh, security being one of the areas right where you want to have the right kind of tools and technologies to prevent against adversarial threats model threats certified defenses etc and then you also want to make sure you know the privacy is preserved both for data and ai models right and which also goes back to some of these uh, global regulations in place right and when we are working in an environment where we have multiple parties exchanging information we want to make sure you know there is confidentiality and confidentiality and trust amongst these collaborating partners. Now, in general, uh, one of the things also, like this is not also nice to have, this is also a must have. Now, when we look at GDPR, which came as a rule, right, which forced a lot of the companies to actually go back and take a look at their practices and uh, regulations and laws, how they were handling data, this is also applicable to AI, right? A uh, consequence of this broad definition of personal data is that you know even machine learning models which have been trained on that data, they are amenable to certain attacks and in uh, you know principle can qualify as personal data, right? And this is a way of thinking uh, which has been propagated, but also now there is a, you know there are research papers etc. which are coming out which are saying that you know essentially that if we have used training data, right, which has created models then you know you can also reverse engineer this process right so that means you know you're not only um, required to protect your data and and uh, comply with the gdpr rules but you also make sure that you know the models which you are producing they are not amenable to adversarial attacks where the process can be reverse engineered and someone can you know reproduce some of the sensitive information uh, from the data on which these models were trained etc right so it actually starts falling in the concept of and, and in the purview of gdpr there now, there can be, you know, uh, real life consequences, right? So one of the uh, examples we used to have, like, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, when we launched um, adversary robustness toolbox was that, you know, if you look at stop signs, and, you know, you can, it can either be adversarially modified explicitly or because of wear and tear, a self-driving car cannot detect a stop sign and goes right through the through this right and causing real life consequences 
Now, this was an example which we had uh, when we were actually, you know, uh, launching this toolkit and we used to use in demo demos. But, you know, it's actually has ha happened in real world. Now, if you see, there was a headline that, you know, hackers steered a Tesla into oncoming traffic by actually placing three small stickers on the road. So, you know, we were not far off. This is now happening, right? These are all the real world examples, right? Where undetected ransomware is being installed and being in, and, and encrypting your computer, right? Your email security system is being uh, compromised, right? And increasing your chances of phishing attacks. Uh, your health data is being compromised. All these real world attacks are happening right here, right now. So when we talk in the context of, you know, adversarial threats to machine learning, you are looking at, uh, you know, a few different kinds of threats, right? Uh, evasion, which is essentially, you know, uh, you are modifying your input to influence the model output, right? So typically in this case, you have a black box uh, model where you're sending certain inputs and getting outputs. And then, you know, you're modifying as you're learning through it, right, to, to get the desired output, right, which can be uh, by sending more adversarially generated input. Uh, poisoning, which essentially, you know, if a hacker has a backdoor entry, they can go back and, and modify your training data, right? And use this exploit later on when the uh, when your AI models are running in production to, to do much bigger attacks, right? And this is the kind of attack which has been happening a lot as well. Extraction where, you know, uh, in cases where the proprietary models themselves are being, being you know, uh, stolen and then inference which is essentially as as i was talking about right the reverse engineering where you know you can actually based on you know how do you attack a particular model and get output you can you know learn more about the private data which was used uh, behind the model right so a lot of these different kind of attacks are happening uh, at the surface of the model so adversarial robustness toolbox uh, is a toolkit which essentially plays into this area and handles and gives you capabilities to, to uh, mitigate things, right? So um, it's uh, essentially a tool for both developers as well as researchers, right? And the areas where it works is around evaluating. It will uh, measure whether your model is vulnerable to adversarial attacks. If the model is found vulnerable to adversarial attacks, it will give you algorithms to defend against those adversarial attacks, right? And it also allows you to certify, right, based on certain metrics, whether your model is robust or not, right? So all these capabilities are, are built into these uh, into this toolkit, right, for different kind of uh, models, for example, for classification models, object generation models, uh, encoding models, et cetera, right? And it works across both deep learning and machine learning uh, frameworks. So TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, MXNet. And then, you know, you go to the machine learning world with scikit-learn, XGBoost, uh, CatBoost, it works consistently across all these different deep learning and machine learning frameworks with all kinds of data, whether it's images, tables, audio, video, etc. Very popular project, right? And and you know, being used uh, extensively, right? Now uh, the tools which are present there are both for you know uh, what we call and what is a term being used in the industry uh, where you have the uh, red team, right, which is the people who are trying to uh, take advantage or, you know, attack your models, right? So all these methods we talked about, poisoning, evaluation, inference, evaluation, extraction, evasion, that's what, you know, the red team is doing. And then you have the blue team, right, which is essentially uh, what uh, the team which is required to defend against these kind of attacks, right? So it detects whether the data has been poisoned, it makes sure, you know, while training the models, we are doing adversarial training on adversarially generated samples and ensuring that the output which is being produced cannot be manipulated, right? It's doing detection against invasion. It's doing certification and verification. So art, you know, actually provides you a lot of these, these uh, algorithms and tools to actually um, work against, you know, what the red teams or the hackers are trying to do uh, against uh, models, right? And the kind of adversarial attacks they are launching. Now, the way the art repository is organized, right, it has uh, actually, you know, uh, method uh, and algorithms to craft different kinds of attacks, whether you're talking about evasion attacks, poisoning attacks, extraction attacks. And if your model is found vulnerable to adversarial attacks, it give you, gives you a lot of, you know, defense mechanisms, using detectors, trainers, transformers, et cetera. And then, you know, there are also metrics, right? So you can actually certify uh, your models uh, on different stores, how vulnerable it is to adversarial attacks. You can uh, 
add you know uh, different quantifying robustness metrics and uh, to your models and then there are uh, tools around you know evaluating right uh, the defenses right how much uh, defense you have built into your models now multiple companies are essentially you know uh, contributing and using art uh, ibm obviously is is the originator and we moved the project in open source then we moved it in linux foundation and then the community has formed and we have the companies from the likes of microsoft troj ai intel general motors darpa and even academia like you know uh, the renaissance polytechnic institute agh university right uh, coming and working with us jointly in open source in terms of you know uh, using and contributing back to our the project is pretty popular some of the metrics as you can see right we have had more than 150000 downloads and there are other, other tools built on top of art which have spawned like armory counterfeit ai privacy toolkit from different vendors on different companies right which are also available in open source uh, in fact, you know, DARPA, uh, which is, or, or, uh, as, as we all know, is, is, you know, the government arm of defense uh, research, it came and gave a presentation very recently in the Linux Foundation AI and Data Trusted AI Committee, uh, how they are actually using their GARD program, which is essentially, GARD stands for Guaranteeing AI Robustness Against Deception, to, to put technologies and tools and techniques in place uh, to counter against uh, different kinds of attacks which can be done on on AI models, right? As you can see from their perspective, there are different kinds of attacks. The three broad attacks they are classifying like physical attacks, which yeah, you can go in the real world and things like you know stop signs, traffic signs. You can um, you know modify for some things like self driving cars, etc., to fail. Poisoning attacks where you get access to the data uh backdoor entry to the data and then you know create an exploit which will leverage later on and digital attacks which are essentially you know when your models are deployed in production and you are sending adversarially generated inputs to get a uh, different output uh right so all these different kind of attacks is is the area where you know darpa is working on and and essentially you know they are leveraging uh, adversarial robustness toolbox uh, as part of that work and they are very closely collaborating with IBM, right? They have provided a, a very heavy funding as well to the art tool. So we are grateful to them for, for this collaboration. Okay, uh, let's talk uh, a bit uh, about art and practice, right? So uh, essentially, you can actually run this demo on your own on a website, right? So you can go to uh, uh, art-demo mybloomix.net, right? You can look at this image and then, you know, you can choose a different kind of attack. In this case, the fast gradient attack. So initially when you saw, you know, the, without any kind of attack, when the model is like 92% confident that this is a Siamese cat. Refresh it a bit. All right, so right now it's 100% confident. This is a mouse trap and this is a Siamese cat. And let me choose a method. And now if you see if I make the strength low, it thinks it's an Egyptian cat. And if I make the attack strength more with this false gradient method, you know, the confidence is decreasing, right? Uh, we can choose something, another like projected gradient descent, which essentially is a pretty strong attack. In that case, like it starts predicting it's a basketball. Right, so if you can see behind the code, you know, the code, which is essentially uh, the art code and the art SDK, which we are using to actually use the projected gradient descent and, and launch that attack. So this model is found to be vulnerable to adversarial attacks, right? As you can see, the model is now predicting this is a basketball, right? So you can use one of the now defense techniques and different algorithms which art provides. So something like spatial uh, smoothening, for example, you know, which is, you know, you really use the pixel areas on this so that there is less area to attack. And by implementing this, as you can see, the model is back to predicting with 76% confidence that this is a CMS scan. And if I implement an increase more of spatial smoothening in terms, that means you know I'm reducing the pixel uh, attack pixels uh, to reduce the attack area. The model's confidence is increasing. Right. So you can try out um, the the demo here, the project itself. You can you know go to the GitHub repository. It, github.com slash trusted AI, and you will find the project there. And all the different you know, algorithms, um, 
for uh, generating adversarial attacks and, and defense are there. Great. Uh, let me go back and we'll cover very quickly. Okay, let's talk about you know Qflow and Trusted AI, right? So um, we are uh, in this conference, and I I think you know for the most part uh, I'm assuming you know folks would be aware of what Qflow stands for. It's it's a, a project in the machine learning ML ops space for end to end uh, machine learning and AI. So it gives you tools and technologies for creating your models, running distributed training on your models, launching hyperparameter optimization, deploying your models in production, and then gives you capabilities uh, like pipelines, et cetera, to tie all these things together. Specifically, there are two projects which are very popular in the space called Qflow Pipelines and Qflow Serving, right? And a bit about these projects, Qflow Pipelines gives you a Python DSL to program your pipelines um, uh, using Python, but then you can launch it on a cloud infrastructure like Kubernetes. So a lot of the Kubernetes capabilities like Kubernetes secrets, Kubernetes, uh, volumes, etc. They are all exposed using Python-centric way. So for the data scientists, they just need to program their pipelines uh, using Python. And behind the scenes, when we launch it in um, on Kubernetes, right, each of these steps are being orchestrated using containers. So very, very popular project in the space, and it allows you to launch a lot of the end-to-end -end machine learning and AI lifecycle capabilities. Right, and we have. Uh, integrated a lot of the trusted AI projects around fairness, explainability, and adversarial robustness into the Qflow umbrella, All right? And Andrew was here, he's going to talk a bit more in detail about how we are leveraging something like adversarial robustness toolbox with Qflow, for example, in this context. Similarly, you know, you can do more advanced things using these pipelines. So as you can see, we are, are you know, uh, not only training our models, deploying our models, we are monitoring them from drift detection, outlier detection, a lot of these other trusted AI capabilities, right, which can be done using these Qflow pipelines. Then the other significant project in, in Qflow umbrella is called KF Serving, which was founded by Google, Selden, IBM, Bloomberg, and Microsoft. And it's essentially focused on deploying your models in production, but also, you know, giving and monitoring your models in production for things like bias, drift, anomaly, and other things, right? So. As part of that, we have also integrated the trusted AI projects into the KF serving suite, and they are available there for the monitoring and metrics capability when you actually deploy your models in production. And again, you know, Andrew is going to show some of these capabilities as we move forward with this. Now, one of the technologies which we use behind the scenes in KF serving to enable some of these metrics around adversarial robustness or fairness, et cetera, is payload logging, which is responsible for collecting all the inputs which are coming for a model prediction and model inferencing, and then taking the responses and logging them over a period of time where we can you know, do more advanced analysis around whether your model has been drifting, is there an anomaly, is your model being fair over the course of large many predictions, right? So that's what uh, the payload logging capability is used for, and it builds on a standard core cloud events uh, protocol. Okay. And now I will pass on to Andrew to actually take you through how we are leveraging art uh, with the Qflow umbrella. So Andrew, over to you. Great, thanks Anush. So we're going to show some of the Qflow pipelines examples first, and then we'll move on to KF serving. So as Anamesh had mentioned previously, we have trusted AI pipelines that can go through and work on a trained model that you have and take a look at how fair it's behaving, uh, get explanations for those models, uh, ex the classifications that they've made, and getting robust examples, testing robustness on uh, against adversaries as well. And so specifically, one of the art components that we have and we're going to look at a demo for is through Kubeflow pipelines. And so we're going to take a look at some of the input parameters and output parameters to get an idea of what exactly it's doing. And then I'll show you inside the Kubeflow dashboard just to take a look at it in real time. So some of the input parameters we have here are basics for any concept here in AI, like clip values and uh, what is the shape of the samples that you're giving your model and the Art algorithm needs this to understand your data a little bit better, as well as some of the test set pathways. Where exactly are is your feature test set uh, and your label test set, so that it can go and grab that. And the method that we're using is the FGSM, the fast gradient sign method, 
Uh, it's basically, it's going to take a number of samples and run them up against your model and then calculate the loss and the gradient of the loss uh, and then take the sign gradient loss and move in that pathway to get closer to an adversarial example um, for overall. And so once fast gradient sign method has uh, started working, you'll start to see those examples uh, with different levels of noise around it to it'll look fairly similar in most cases to the original sample, but uh, in little, a little different, uh, but the average person wouldn't be able to tell that it's being attacked in, in most cases. And so that's where we have it, it inputs like the FGSM attack epsilon, how quickly do we want to move towards it? Uh, and then other inputs like the loss function, what loss function are we actually want to look at? Uh, and th things like that. So then we'll move towards the output parameters. Uh, so what will this component is actually going to do is it's going to take the accuracy on the test data that hasn't been uh, ran up against for adversarial samples and then check the accuracy against the adversarial samples as well. So in this picture here, the test data accuracy is 87% compared to the adversarial sample accuracy of 13%. So obviously this would tell you that this is probably not a robust model because there's a significant, a greater than 50% difference in accuracy uh, between adversarial samples and general test data. This component will also give you a little bit more information about where the robustness uh, is having issues. So confidence reduced uh, just based off of each sample and then also average perturbation as well in the misclassified samples. So how far did the algorithm have to change your picture in order to get it to misclassify? And then it also assign whether or not it thinks that the model is robust or not. In this example, it does not. So pulling up the Kubeflow dashboard here. So this is what the pipeline looks originally. And uh, you can get the training step, the fairness check that we'll be doing, uh, and a ever so robustness evaluation. And so this actually looks like a very large, very complicated YAML, but like NMS said, what it, we are actually using originally is a Python DSL. Uh, so you won't have to touch that very long, complicated YAML. Instead, you'll be able, and most Python DSLs look uh, much smaller than this, but you can uh, list some of the uh, ideas, some of the parameters that we had specified earlier and get a more general uh, view of the Python DSL. So the Python DSL moves into the YAML that we see here and then further one more to the DAG that gets displayed in the Kubeflow pipelines uh, UI. So then we can go create a run and uh, we can choose an experiment. I already have one set up for trusted AI. And then you can input the parameters that you want if you want to mess up uh, with the epsilon value, if your data is going to be somewhere else, uh, the namespace that you're using. In this example, we're gonna be using this namespace, the Kubeflow user example, just because it's basic here. And let's see, now we can run it from here. So on top of the parameters that we had talked about in the slides. There's also some parameters for the uh, fairness component as well. And so we'll run this and it will show up like this, uh, running and pending. And then as it moves through, it'll start to run and the other DAG, the other pieces of the DAG will show up. And so this one's already cached, so it'll go fairly quickly. Generally, this pipeline, I think, takes 10 minutes or so. But because we're just getting cache results, um, it's just going to come up fairly quickly. So you can see from the logs here, this was taken from cache. But specifically, let's look at this is the uh, this is just the train step. So it has lots of information. But we're just going to take a look at the adversarial robustness step here. So now we can see exactly what those values look like. Um, so this is the input shape. We're using a 0.2 attack epsilon, which we had specified in the original parameters. Um, and then like we talked about the output here, you can see it had fairly similar results to what we had, almost uh, identical. And uh, it has, again, concluded that it is not very robust. And then also these 
outputs get put into our output artifacts so that you can utilize them in other pipelines as needed, uh, touching around with them later. And then model fairness, fairly similar what we saw from ART, and all of the parameters that we had pre-specified, and then as well as uh, telling us whether things are biased or fair or not. Uh, we won't touch too much on this because this is mostly based around security, but to give you an example, disparate impact is the probability that something from a privileged class gets a favorable outcome divided by the probability that someone from an unprivileged class gets a favorable outcome. And so any uh, number between 0.8 and 1.2 is considered fairly good. So this is a fairly uh, unbiased model that we've trained here. So it is not robust, but it is very fair. But now we're gonna move back in and take a look at kit serving. And so as Animesh mentioned, uh, with this project, we have moved and attempting to move more and more of the Trusted AI project into chaos serving, enabling that as it is needed, payload loggings, uh, the different methods of Trusted AI as well. And so one of the things that we've done pertaining towards security and the adversarial robustness toolbox is implementing the square attack method, which is basically take any image like the image on the left for a MNIST digit, and this one is the sample of one, and adding some noise over it is similar to what you see on the right, and trying to get your model to misclassify. And so some of the parameters, it's kind of similar to how it's done in Kubeflow pipelines, but you can specify the adversary type uh, as, the, as more and more get added, you can choose something else. And, uh, but in this example, we'll use the square attack, whereas in the pipelines example, we'd use the fast gradient sign method. And then also the, you can set the max number of iterations. So how many iterations can your, your art method run and try and find a uh, adversarial example on it? And so basically how it looks in KF serving is that you get an explainer spec like this, and you have this predictor already that you've developed and deployed, and all you have to do is add the explainer spec on as well. And uh, this will give you a, uh, similar to the parameters that we mentioned earlier, you can add the square attack type, because the number of classes is 10, and then if we wanted to change the max iterations, we could do that as well. And so it's very simple if you've already deployed a predictor to deploy an explainer as well. And the way the flow works here is that a client requests an explanation, gets routed through the HDO gateway to any explainer. It could be an AIX explainer, uh, a robustness explainer, a fairness explainer. And then it gets that explainer can sample from your predictor through the HDO local gateway and get an idea of what your model is looking like. And so for that, we'll show a demo as well. So. Here, let me pull it up. So basically what we're gonna show here is that we're going to query, well, first we're gonna put up a inference service and then we're gonna query it. So speaking of security that we had earlier, the there's Istio Dex uh, for authentication here. So there's a few extra things than we have and have set up previously, not so we don't have to do now getting a session token and using that uh, in the running of it. And then once you've done that, if you have a full deployment of an Istio Dex Kubeflow, then you can move on to working specifically with art. And what we have here is we're going to put up a inference server, in inference service, which is already up. Um, and I'll show you the pods that are up for it. There's one for the predictor, the model that we have, and then also one for the explainer, yeah. So see here, the explainer and the predictor. And like we said, the explainer will query the predictor and the predictor will send back responses and that's how your explainer will get an idea of it. And so on top of that, we'll look at the inference service just to show you that that is up as well. Um, so it's ready to receive requests and uh, now we can do that as well. And so we already have this uh, script set up for querying it and dealing with the security as we've mentioned earlier. And uh, 
So as we run it, it's going to push and uh, check the model and try and move along that gradient for what we can assume is an adversarial example for the original image. So it'll take a couple of seconds and then give us a response. And it found an adversarial example. So you can see on the left, we've displayed the original image. And then on the right, we've shown that this is the image that our model mispredicts on. And so just with a simple rectangle added here, we can get the model to mispredict a 9, uh, where it should be saying a 3 instead. And so you can collect up a, a bunch of these adversarial examples and retrain your model on it if you want to add some robustness uh, measures to defend against these adversarial attacks. And so jumping back in here. So we have uh, a large team for the adversarial robustness toolbox. You can, like I mentioned, you can find us on GitHub uh, with github.com slash AI and specifically the adversarial robustness toolbox. Um, there's, like Animesh mentioned, the LFAI monthly meetings, uh, tons of places that you can reach us, uh, Slack, GitHub, uh, all over the place. And uh, just to give you some extra links as well, there are the both the demos that we have here, uh, linked in GitHub, and then Animesh and I's uh, contact locations. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Andrew. I think this is great. So there is, as you can see, um, you know, there are a lot of other sessions happening at the Open Source Summit North America by the Code team. So please go in and attend them. And I hope, you know, you uh, learned a uh, few things from our session today, like you know why um, the need to act on model security and AI security is very prominent right now, and it's not also you know nice to have. It essentially is you know when you're looking at laws like GDPR, it's one of those things which you must do because you know uh, these things go back uh, to the point that you know model is a representation of the data, and there is reverse engineering which can happen, right? And hopefully you learned you know how you can leverage these. Uh, this toolkits and more specifically art in an MLOps platform like Qflow, whether it's Qflow pipelines or KF serving uh, to actually, you know, uh, defend against adversarial attacks in real time, whether for a model deployed in production or, you know, while you are running distributed training, et cetera, using Qflow pipelines. With that, uh, thanks again and, and thanks for joining us and see you in some other session or uh, some other conference. Thank you guys. Bye. Thanks.